future is gonna be okay. We're going to make it. Oh, snap! The Corvette C8 is the mid-engine flagship Chevy tried to build since the 1970s. Every time a new generation of Corvette was announced without any details, the rumors started sprouting up like dandelions. Oh, this is the year. The engine is moving. This is a C4. It's going to be a mid-engine. Oh, the C5. That's going to be the mid-engine. Oh, the C6. The C6 is going to be the year. Oh, the C7. The C7 is going to... But now, but, but now finally GM came out. They came out with the glow up. Dude, I thought the C7 was good for GM. Like, good for GM, right? A new level for domestic manufacturing. But the C8 is good on a global scale. Look at this arm padding. Look where it tucks underneath the shifter switch cluster. No bunching, no creasing. I mean, if this was a BMW, a Mercedes, Acura, or Lexus, we wouldn't tolerate mistakes. But with GM, it's like, hey, what are you going to do? So when GM gets something really right, well, it's like me getting 100% on an algebra test. It's national news. GM is clearly gunning right at Ferrari with this $70,000 lookalike. $70,000, right? Could be $80,000. Depends on what the dealer wants to do. Look at the back. The typeface spacing of the word Corvette is all new age Brookstone airport espresso bar. The front emblem is sharper and wider. It's very McLaren-esque. Now, while we were filming, bystanders came up and asked for pictures. Some contractors asked us, they came up to us and said like, hey, you're giving away test drives. And while we were driving along, phones were pressed up against windows. And only 50% of the people knew that this was a Corvette. And people looked at me as I exited the vehicle. In their eyes, I was someone of exceptional consequence. In a Corvette C7, well, you're just another Corvette owner. Do you want cheese on your burger now? Or just after I take it off the grill? But with a C8, it's people going, oh, so what do you do? And the C8 will force you to look the part too. Because... And this next bit is going to sting. This is a car unfriendly to fat. Your peanut M&M, Coors Banquet, Belly, Wendy's, Thighs, Kettle Chips, Arms are, are going to get squished by the aggressive bolstering that only adjusts out so far. And if you have a gunt, Lord of mercy, it's getting pushed up by the thick driver's door onto your left and the wide center console to the right. It's like a push-up bra for just your mass. It's gonna, uh, a C8 forces you to face your poor diet and lazy exercise attitude right in the face. The square wheel isn't going to help you. That's just there to allow you to exit the C8. Defeated. Uh-oh, you're too fat to drive it. In this, and in this gesture, General Motors built... 2020's number one automotive hot take. The Corvette is no longer for boomers. See, I've heard the C8 described in person as, that's a rich man's car. And I love that phrase. I love it. It's so exterior, so transparent. That's a rich man's car. That means I want it, but I'm not willing to work for it. So I'll pretend the object of my desire is unworthy of my working class values. See also sour grapes. But if you do take care of your body and you can afford dealer markups, you are treated to a driving experience that is more futuristically optimistic than next gen. Mechanical gauges, gone. In their place are Tesla S multifunction displays and one heads up display, which you can see clearly in sunshine. HVAC happy trail, HVAC happy trail, HVAC happy trail. Run your thumb down my HVAC happy trail, HVAC happy trail, 
HVAC Happy Trail. Like a console controller, Xbox really, you wrap your finger around the HVAC and press the buttons with your thumb. Within one second, it's intuitive. This is the best HVAC arrangement since the three dials. Performance! Well, it's not fast by 2020 standards. In a sea of Hellcats, Demons, Turbo LS engines, 2JZs, 490 horsepower from a direct injected 6.2 liter is satisfactory. The impressive numbers come instead from the C8's fuel economy. 15 city, 27 highway. That's what my camera card does. Um, and while you're looking at it, you can see how small a C8 is. James, the owner, claims that he got 37 miles per gallon highway for a long stretch across Montana. And he averaged 29 miles per gallon for his whole trip from Bozeman, Montana to East Pennsylvania. The C8 accomplishes this through a combination of cylinder deactivation and slippery aerodynamics. The underside of the C8 is covered nose to tail. Maybe it's illusory, but I feel the C8 cutting the air while I drive like a fresh razor blade into an Amazon box. My H-up display tachometer there, well, that's a bullseye. The paddle shifters are triggers for my laser repeaters. The drive mode selector calibrates the FTL. The combo mirror monitor, well, that's my rear sensor array. The built-in dash cam for the SD card slot, well, that's my in-flight recorder. Every drive with a C8 is a mission into the slipstream. And I believe that these sci-fi things are real because 2020 reality is subjective. And the C8 embraces this. Christ, it's good. Watch my point of view drive for this. It's coming out like tomorrow the day after. The universe was due a mid-engine Corvette after everyone from Harley Earl to Zora Arkis Duntov to Bill Mitchell fought to get one on the road. But why now? Well, a mid-engine Corvette is the automotive equivalent of anti-aging cream. When studies peg your average consumer base at 59 years old, you need a way to lower the numbers so you're not sharing the same demographic as people who watch NXT every Wednesday. The desperation for a mid-engine Corvette goes back to the 1960s. Harley Earl couldn't make it happen before his retirement, and the responsibility passed on to Zora Arkis Duntov, who had a hard-on for performance engineering. But by the 60s, GM was out of the racing business to avoid getting kneecapped by the government's anti-monopoly laws since the company already owned 53% of the U.S. car market, dangerously close to the 60% that would have necessitated government intervention. So all that work Arkis Duntov was doing on the Serve 1 concept, or the Serve 2, yeah, he might as well have been working on a Serve 1 quiche. And the blueprints for a possible mid-engine Corvette had to go out the window with the baby and the bath water. Now, another attempt was made in the 1970s, but this time the Arab oil embargo killed Arkis Duntov's XP882 concept. Then, in 1977, GM killed the four-rotor AeroVet to save money. So while you could blame the government for initially killing the first mid-engine attempt, this time the calls were coming from inside the house. Fast forward to 2008, when chief engineer Tom Wallace fought for a mid-engine Corvette only for the financial crisis to hit and essentially reorganize priorities in the auto industry to the point where GM wasn't even positive there would be another Corvette. And yet, even then, when the Corvette was rescued for the millionth time and the C7 went into the planning stages, it was once again planned to be the first Corvette with a mid-engine layout. But corporate again deemed the development costs too high. So GM kept the front engine rear wheel drive layout, yet demand inevitably won out. And so here we are. And it's more or less everything you'd expect of a mid-engine Corvette. On the one hand, this is a car that wants you to embrace your role in the hamster wheel of excessive consumption. Ready? 
because this thing is loaded with features you might never even use. Whether it's the performance traction management settings, or the freaking SD card slot in the glove box to record performance data, or the Z mode that allows you to customize engine, transmission, steering, and suspension settings, and even the engine sound. It's all there, and it's all nice to have. <laughs> But odds are, a lot of the features will remain as untouched as the vegetable peeler mom got you for the housewarming of your first apartment. It's basically capitalism, the car. Let's innovate and accentuate these features in the name of competition. You know what I mean? And so you're encouraged to proudly shed the pliant skin of fiscal modesty and dive headlong into the sarlacc maw of credit-ruining spending habits in the name of doing your part as the leg of this Voltron structure called the economy. But who cares? The C8 is quicker than post-Lent sex. The feeling of acceleration is that of the coffee finally doing its job. The handling is confident like village-raised children. And if I were any farther up my own ass right now, I could wear my own body as a hat. I mean, for crying out loud, you have launch control. So while you'll never get to go to space, you can have liftoff when you get yote from the Earth whence you came, as the system governs tire spin while launching the C8 in order to achieve greater straight-line acceleration. This car has the confidence of a college freshman shooting his shot with his favorite Twitch streamer. Carpe diem? Nah, bro. Carpe into those DMs. Now, although he's only owned this car for a few months, James seems pretty used to the stares and the questions and also the incrementally aggressive performance. He told me it was basically a poor man's Ferrari that actually performs like one. And I can see that argument. The C8 drives with the grace of a swimmer through calm water, that slight bit of resistance giving way to furious, consistent forward motion. Just a light touch of the pedal and you're getting pulled like an amateur tug job. Just the act of merging liquefies the bowels. I, I was doing the speed limit and I, I just, it was like my entire life was flashing before my eyes. This thing is preposterous the way it goes, the way it wants to. It's a car with childbearing hips that sits lower to the ground than octogenarian nuts. It's a well-balanced car, even if it's, you know, not 50-50 distribution, it's 40-60 front to rear. The eight-speed dual-clutch transmission is great, even if I didn't really care much for the paddle shifters, but that's always been a sort of hang-up of mine anyway, so, eh. Long story short, it's a rocket launcher that can hurl itself forward like a cannonball from an undead pirate ship, or cruise like the most ubiquitous daily you've ever owned. It's almost like trying virtual reality for the first time. That level of immersion, that feeling of depth that you didn't yet know we had the technology to achieve. And then it'll record your drive and the audio in the cabin so you can share it with your friends like it's a PlayStation 4. This is a car for car YouTubers. Let me repeat, this is a car for car YouTubers. Because young people like the YouTubes, and why not make it easier for people to make videos about your car, in your car? In GM's desperate throes to be witnessed by the youth market, they've appealed to the middlest common denominator, people who like filming themselves doing things to later show others the things they've done. For crying out loud, there are four cameras built into this thing. Two on the front bumper that blend into one image, one in the rear above the license plate, and one on the roof as a video rear view mirror, in case you don't feel like using the regular one. It's more or less what I expected the future to be like as a kid. It, actually, it's closer to what I expected being Batman would be like, getting poured into a seat that embraces you and brings the wheel to your chest and practically welcomes you with all-encompassing technology. It's real life, but it feels like a video game programmer's idea of it. Hell, if you told me this thing turned into a plane after clearing three specific Imperial bases, I'd believe you. Yet the C8 is still a car of fragmentary identities. It sits like an MR2. It has the accelerant spirit of the Lotus Elise. It's a car that's been mistaken for a McLaren 720S on the way to this shoot, and mistaken for a Ferrari in other places at least from what James tells me. Hell, I drove this with James to an advance auto to buy a new alternator for Red Betty, and one inquisitive young lady asked if it was a Thunderbird. Although to be fair to her, I 
would imagine she wasn't exactly a car person and just wanted to make conversation by bringing up the first cool sounding car she could think of. At the very least, she seemed more pleasant than the guy we found taking a selfie in front of it when we exited the store. And I imagine that's the sort of thing you'll frequently have to deal with if you own a car like this. But I get the appeal. I mean, look at it. It's a real gem in this movement towards broadening American exoticism, crafting domestic cars with foreign supercar aptitude. You don't just see it here, but you see it in the Ford GT, the Tesla Roadster, and the Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat Red Eye. You get the sleek yet jagged look of Michael Bay's Transformers, but with the performance of something vastly superior to Michael Bay's Transformers. Look, I've never been a big Corvette guy, but for me personally, this is my favorite car I've yet driven on RCR. It's an absolute blast, which is not to say it's perfect. No car is, but this is a comprehensive experience and beyond my expectations. But then again, the shortest route to satisfaction is through modest expectation. Yeah, uh, about the song, I'm actually locked out of my apartment, and also it's really windy, so I would love to be able to record something, but also I blew an alternator, and, uh, oh, not on the C8, no, that's perfectly fine, but also, you know, life, life happens, it, uh, it, uh, finds a way, so...